Hi there, this is Jurgen Westmanson. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis blog. This episode is about the art of giving yourself a panic attack. As with anything else in life, you know, if you're going to have panic attacks, you might as well really master them and make sure that you get the most bang for the buck. Not only that, to also make sure that you maintain them and never quite resolve them. So believe it or not, there is a recipe or a kind of set of recipes. There is an art to doing this. And, you know, being the fortunate guy that I am, I've spent the last 23 years seeing clients. I've seen a lot of people who have been really good at having panic attacks. And in this video, I'm going to share the recipes. I'm going to share with you what the master's panic attacks do to really amp them up and get the most out of them. So before you get into this one, if, if you haven't seen my previous video about how to be constantly anxious, I highly recommend that you go back and watch that one because it kind of lies the groundwork for this and everything in that video is relevant for what we're doing here. So assuming that you watch that one, you know, anxiety is really easy. Pretty much everyone can do anxiety. Panic attacks, uh, probably not everyone can do panic attacks. You probably need some innate disposition or talent to get really good at it. But a lot of people seem to have this talent, and if you're one of the fortunate ones who do, here are uh, tips and strategies to, uh, to make sure that you get the most bang for them. So going back to anxiety a little bit, remember that if you're going to be anxious, you have to demand something. You have to demand some guarantee of life or some guarantee of yourself in terms of performance, uh, or you have to demand some guarantee from other people in terms of them respecting you, appreciating you, loving you, accepting you, whatever that might be. So what I've noticed with people who do panic attacks is that pretty much without exception, if you ask them, they will admit that in the period leading up to the first panic attack, they usually had a lot of rumination, a lot of excessive thinking going on. They, they're they usually stuck in some sort of conflict, something that's tearing at them, some sort of catch-22. So what you really need is a kind of catch-22 set of competing masturbatory demands. I'll repeat that. What you want is a kind of catch-22 set of competing masturbatory demand. For example, let's say that you're in a relationship, you know, you, you might have on the one hand a, you know, I really have to get out of this relationship, but I can't. Or, I can't stand my work, you know, but uh, I'm unable to leave. Or uh, I have to know whether or not to go back to my relationship and simultaneously not knowing, the thinking that you have to know. So two masturbatory demands in two different directions. Uh, if you can have that in some situation pertaining work or relationship or something like that, uh, that's great. Because your mind, you know, your, your mind's just going to keep ruminating and ruminating and ruminating and ruminating and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And then once the pressure or the tension gets high enough, people usually have or a panic attack. Now, there's there's a few other things that you you know kind of have to have in place to get there. So 
if you notice that, you know, at work or, or in your relationship or in your family that you're kind of caught in this conflict of competing masturbatory demands, you know, make sure that you stay put in the situation and that you don't really do anything to improve it or actually leave it. And or if you do stay put in the situation, make sure that you don't develop the psychological skills, capacities, or distinctions that would allow you to be free of the conflict. So you, you, you really have to make sure that you stay in a unbearable conflict over time and, and don't really adapt your psychology. So that's going to really help. Now, it seems to me, too, that very often people have a tendency to, to have their panic attack, you know, on a plane, in some sort of confined area, or perhaps in a meeting, you know, if they're in a meeting where they're kind of trapped in of sorts and there's kind of no escape. Um, so you have some sort of catch-22 situation in your life that you, you have these uh, competing masturbatory demands and you're ruminating. Uh, one thing you can do to really um, increase the chances that you will have a panic attack is to just make sure that you're sleep deprived. Now, the, the, the masturbatory rumination and thinking is, is going to, you know, likely mess with your sleep anyways. But, but in case it doesn't, make sure to not prioritize sleep during a period like that so that you are sleep deprived. And make sure to not quite take care of yourself. Uh, alcohol really seems to help too, to really muck up your sleep. If you use alcohol, you know, before you go to sleep, you you pretty much ruin your 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 deep sleep phase. Um, that's going to help as well. Um, so, a lot of work, uh, sleep deprivation, some alcohol, uh, partying, hard partying, that type of stuff, and then once you're kind of hungover, you know, get on a plane. That seems to be a, a great recipe. So after a period of a lot of rumination, you know, if you're going on a business trip or vacation or some trip with your spouse or whatever, you know, make sure to get some heavy partying in there, sleep deprivation, some alcohol, and then put yourself on a plane in a kind of sleep deprived, hungover state. Now, not only that, Make sure that you also get quite a bit of caffeine, you know, in your system before you board that plane to kind of amplify your physiology a bit while you're kind of hungover and sleep deprived. Um, something else that's also really likely to work uh, is if you can, you know, be a bit late to the plane and make sure that you then have to, in that state, you know, run. Uh, and really move your body so that your, your 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 pulse goes up. You know, you start sweating a bit. Uh, make sure that you have to do that, that you have to really stress to get on the plane. So that then once you get into the plane, if it's kind of cramped and you have people next to you and it suddenly goes silent, you, you, become, you, you begin to feel that your body is kind of uneasy and your heart's beating and you kind of feel trapped. That, that seems to be a perfect recipe for generating a um, a panic attack. Uh, same goes with a meeting. You know, if if you can be at some sort of conference uh, after a uh, water rumination, sleep deprived, you know, get a lot of coffee into your system. Make sure that you 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 stress run into some sort of meeting. Make sure that you sit and you kind of feel constricted. Um, doesn't seem to be as good a strategy as the the plane thing, but but this one also seems to uh, seems to work pretty well. You know, there, there there's a very interesting uh, set of studies I read about where you a bit like the classic Milgram obedience experiments. You put someone in a room, 
you have this actor who's not really hooked up to stuff, but plays that he is. And the whole gig is that you're going to ask him questions. And then every time he gives the wrong answer to really simple questions, you have the chance of punishing him or her by giving them these, these you know, shots. And what they've noticed is that when they increase the temperature a lot in the room, people have a tendency to get more sadistic, to punish the other person more, and to also report feeling more anger and more irritability. And what's happening is that, you know, as a result of the temperature in the room going up, you know, their blood pressure is going to raise, their, their heartbeat's going to increase, you know, their, their skin per perspiration is going to change. And the brain or the thinking process is going to make sense of that, interpret that. And it's going to use the present context to do so. So, you know, there's this idiot who's giving the wrong answers to simple questions. Oh, this is anger. And that person's making me angry. Let me punish the bastard. You know, so we, we, we have a tendency to kind of misinterpret very neutral body sensations and and create stories about what they mean right so if you can if you can rush up the stairs to the airplane in in that kind of sleep deprived coffee induced hungover state and your your heart's beating and you're sweaty and you're sitting kind of constricted it's very easy then for a lot of people's minds to go oh shit these feelings are due to me being constricted and I can't leave the plane when I want to. And oh shit, how do I get out of here? And I can't get out of here, but I have to get out of here. And and now the sequence is is, is really, really moving. Um so that's that's a great way to uh to initially get your panic attacks. Now it also helps if you're kind of psychologically naive or anti-psychological so that you don't really know anything about this topic so that when you experience this uh you're likely to think that it's a heart attack and, and to be convinced that something's wrong with the physical body you know that that of course also helps um a lot so if if you want to maintain the panic attacks make sure that you stay in the conflict, you know, in the relationship or in the work situation while you have these competing masturbatory demands, you know, uh, so that you can keep revving up your, your, your stress levels and, and having the panic attacks. Um, with a little bit of luck, your, your mind is going to associate being on the plane or being in the meeting room with panic and now you suddenly have this phobic response right where every time you go into that setting you know you you you, you begin to reassociate it and to recreate it and then your mind can begin to uh to generalize it to all sorts of other contexts that remind you of it so now you can begin to have panic attacks all over the place and and have it be so that it seems as if various objects and situations are triggering uh, this feeling inside of you. Of course, uh, not only stay in, in that particular situation, but, but don't update your psychological map. No, don't learn to nuance your, your, your thinking in, in any way, because that, could be, uh, that could be kind of detrimental. Now, of course, even if the situation resolves itself, you know, the relationship ends or you get a new job or whatever it might be, you know, you, you can still keep your panic attacks because just the anticipation of another panic attack, uh, you can go around anticipating them. And then here's a great one. You, you can begin to you see if you know that you can have another panic attack. You then demand a guarantee that you don't have it while you simultaneously internally know that you don't have that guarantee. That's a perfect uh, catch-22 com competing masturbatory demands. And, and then whenever the heart begins to beat or 
you know, things happen in your body, you, you, you can automatically begin to masturbate about having to calm down, you know, must relax, you know, uh, while simultaneously feeling that you can't, and, and you, you can increase it that way. Here's also something really, really important. You know, that feeling of breathlessness, of not getting enough air, is actually the result of over-breathing, you know? So it's kind of counterintuitive, but if you really want to keep your panic attacks, when you feel uh, that breathing constriction, make sure to, to take deep breaths in and then out and, and try to really, really breathe big, you know? Breathe more and breathe more often. Uh, that, that, that's going to constrict your airways even more, give you even more of a feeling of breathlessness, and then your mind can kind of ruminate about that, and then you can really get a lot out of your panic attacks. If there's anything else I've um, I've forgotten here? No, I think um, I think that's pretty much it. Of course, if you you know, it really can help, too, if, if you can begin to, to, to drug yourself, um, do psychiatric drugs, you know, to, to, to make sure that you, to view it as a disease. Um, that, that will often, you know, it, it increase the, the feelings of helplessness, because now you have this disease. Uh, and of course, the, the drugs will often, you know, mess with your brain anyways. And then if you really use the drugs for some time, you can, you, you can, you can get conned into thinking that when you then begin to get anxious again, that just means that you're sick and that you need the drugs instead of kind of realizing that it's actually withdrawal symptoms, which are quite common. You can create a, 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 a drug dependency trap uh, for yourself as well. Now, if you want to do any form of like psychological work or what's called psychotherapy, I highly recommend uh, psychoanalysis or, 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 or something that really focuses on your childhood, uh, your past, and, and which gets you to ruminate about your childhood and your past all the time that you can really engage in these narratives and these stories that's also a great way to remain stuck and of course it also helps if you if you can't really feel your feelings that well to begin with so so make sure that you do what you can to kind of be out of touch with what you feel that your brain has an incentive to, you know, create a panic attack to protect you from feeling stuff that you must not feel. You know, I've, I've lost track over how many, you know, very successful type clients I've had in my office who come in, you know, they have their business success and it's the career woman, you know, when they come in and they say, you know, everyone would be uh, shocked to, to find me here. You know, everyone thinks I'm super in charge and I'm in control of everything and I'm strong. You know, so these people have enormous demands on themselves while it's often forbidden for them to feel the kind of vulnerabilities and insecurities that sometimes go with being human. So the brains kind of create panic attacks, uh, you know, so um, yeah, so I, I I hope this was useful. If you're planning to uh, to to give this a shot, I, I'd be very curious to hear how it goes. To what extent you're able to uh, master the art of giving yourself a panic attack. Um, if you happen to struggle with them and 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 you you like some ideas on how to actually get out of them. Um, I have some good stuff for you there too. You can contact me at provocativehypnosis.com. Till next time.